Tax Policy Center. And I'd like to welcome you all here today to today's event. Um, this is sponsored by the Tax Policy Center. It was planned in conjunction with, with H&R Block. We're going to be talking about cryptocurrency and tax administration. Um, this is an important topic, and it's a very interesting program. Um, as you're all aware, cryptocurrency becoming more and more and more prevalent in transactions in a wide range of, of um, uses. Um, and tax administration, uh, it's important for people to realize what they need to do to comply with the tax law. And part of what we're trying to do is look at the intersection of cryptocurrency and, uh, and the tax system. I want to welcome the online audience as well as the audience here today. Um, just some logistics. When we have uh, Q&A um, uh, sections today, there'll be someone walking around with a microphone. Please wait till the microphone arrives with you before you ask your question. That way people in the room and people online can, can hear your question. Um, you can follow the conversation uh, on social media using the hashtag live at urban. Um, and uh, we're just about ready to go, so let me introduce our first speaker today. It's my pleasure to introduce the IRS Chief Counsel Michael Desmond. He's confirmed by the Senate earlier this year, been on the job seven and a half months or so. Um, just a little background, the Office of Chief Counsel, over a thousand attorneys working there. Um, you can think of this as the world's largest tax law firm. And Mike Desmond's in, in, in charge of that. Uh, he has attorneys who are steeped in every um, component of the, of the tax law, every, every single section. Um, collectively, it's a wealth of information in the office about tax law, policies, procedures, regulations, rules, forms, whole range of things. So Mike has uh, this wealth of knowledge at his disposal, bringing it, uh, some of that here today will share his knowledge on the, the subject of cryptocurrency. After his prepared remarks, um, Mike Desmond says he'll take some, some questions. So if you um, have a question or you, you think of something that, that uh, strikes you during the presentation, please be prepared to, to ask at, at the end of, of the presentation. Now let me welcome Mike Desmond to the stage. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for coming here today. It's good to be here. This is a very timely and important topic. I see a number of my former colleagues from the Treasury Department and IRS in the audience as well. So I know folks that have been in my seat some time ago are now in your seats thinking about the issue of cryptocurrency and certainly getting some valuable insight from them and from a number of other folks here. So um, thank you also to Mark and the Urban Institute and the Tax Policy Center for hosting this. Um, as I said, a very important issue um, for us at the IRS, an emerging area of the economy that we are very focused on. Um, as Mark indicated, I've been on the job as chief counsel for about seven and a half months now. Um, since day one, the issue of virtual currency and the tax consequences and treatment of virtual currency transactions have been very high on my agenda of things to try to address. And also, I know the commissioner has spoken repeatedly and spoken to me in particular about the importance of this issue from a enforcement and compliance perspective in particular. And I'll talk about that a little bit here today as well. Um, before getting into the specifics of what we've been doing and thinking about on virtual currency, I wanted to just pick up on Mark's comments about our office and what we do in the Office of Chief Counsel to give you some perspective on where I come from on this. Um, we have two real roles in Chief Counsel on both the front end of the tax system and the back end of the tax system. Um, Mark had indicated 1,000 lawyers. We're not quite down to that yet. We're at about 1,500 lawyers around the country, um, down a few from a few years ago, but on the rise. We've got a net increase in lawyers this year, but about 1,500 lawyers around the country. Um, and those are divided into two operating functions. Um, on the guidance-related side, we've got six associate offices here in Washington, D.C. that are divided by subject matter. And I've got a number of my colleagues here from the Income Tax and Accounting Associate Office that is focused in particular on the tax treatment of virtual currency. Um, so when we have some questions later, um, I'm not sure we'll have a lot of answers, but we have a team of folks here to take those questions down, and we will certainly consider them and bring them back to our offices. So that's on kind of the front end, and those folks work on publishing guidance and considering issues um, really to give people help in filing tax returns, particularly in new and unique areas like virtual currency. Um, how do we take 
things like that and, and give guidance to taxpayers on how they should be reporting that on their tax returns. So that's the whole regulatory process, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, that's about 500 attorneys, as I said, here in the associate offices in Washington. And then on the back end of the tax system, uh, we've got about 1,000 attorneys around the country in about 50 offices um, who handle both docketed cases in tax court. We have about 25,000 pending at any one point in time. And also giving advice to exam agents and others in the field offices at the IRS around the country. So after returns have been filed, issues been selected for examination, we have teams of lawyers around the country that help to advise exam teams and also, if necessary, litigate cases on the back end. Um, looking at this holistically, our preference is always to address all questions on the front end so that people can file their tax returns with some assurance that they're getting it right and will not be questioned, will not be audited, and will not have uncertainty going forward. Um, that goal is, of course, not always met, and there all are going to be open questions, um, not only in the area of virtual currency, but across all of the economy, issues that we can't always answer on the front end through guidance and through regulations. So that's why we do have the folks on the back end um, and mechanisms for resolution of cases and disputes along the way as well. Um, so that's a very quick overview of the perspective of the Office of Chief Counsel. Um, just in terms of my personal perspective on this, um, I came to Chief Counsel in March after about 25 years um, in practice and in government. Uh, my prior experience in government was in both areas, both the enforcement side and the guidance side. Uh, I spent about four and a half years, four years or so at Treasury uh, back in the early 2000s dealing with um, uh, working on the guidance side, so dealing with regulations and the policy side. So that perspective is something I bring to the Office of Chief Counsel. Um, in private practice and also at a prior event or a prior time in my career, I was at the Justice Department Tax Division. So I also spent a lot of time on the enforcement side, um, litigating cases for the government, mostly out in the Western states. Um, so coming to Chief Counsel is really the um, kind of pinnacle of a, of a career for me to bring together both sides of that, the front end of the, the guidance side and the back end of the enforcement side. Um, and that's the perspective I think I bring to Chief Counsel. Um, the perspective that I don't bring to Chief Counsel is what many of you have, which is in the specifics of things like um, virtual currency, um, what the economy or what the industry looks like, what's happening out there, how it's evolving. Um, so one of the real reasons for me to come here today is not only to speak to you and kind of bring you up to speed on what we're doing, but also to learn from you and to hear from you. Um, these speaking presentations for me are very much a listening session as well. Um, so folks that have questions out there um, want to react to what we're talking about and thinking about. Um, extremely important for us to get that feedback from you, um, particularly for somebody like me that, as I said, doesn't have the industry experience that many of you in the audience do. So um, do hope that we have some time for some listening as well. Um, turning to virtual currency specifically, um, and I'm going to put some numbers out there that probably aren't precise, but just some of the things that I've been reading. Um, recently, I just saw an estimate that about 8% of all adults have some form or hold some form of virtual currency. Um, and we get at the IRS about 150 million tax returns a year. So that would suggest just doing the math that you've got about 12 million returns um, that should be filed every year reporting some form of transaction in virtual currency. Um, we've got some statistics internally in the searches that we've done for reporting. Um, those are probably somewhat imprecise, so I won't give you any specific numbers. But I can tell you we're not seeing 12 million returns that are reporting virtual currency transactions, nowhere near that. Um, so this is a very high um, priority on the enforcement side for the IRS because, because we think there is really a very high degree of noncompliance um, for myriad reasons, um, some of which is that we need to give more guidance out there. Um, but the numbers that we're seeing in terms of the number of tax returns reporting any indication of transacting in virtual currency isn't remotely close to what you might expect to see given what we think um, from what we're reading is the prevalence of virtual currency transactions in the economy. Um, one thing that we've done recently to try to address that and to get some better data on that, um, you all probably saw that the IRS put out a draft of the Form 1040 Schedule 1. Um, for the 2019 tax year, and that has on it a checkbox that says if you've done any transactions in virtual currency, check this box to indicate that you've done that so that we know that somewhere on this return um, should be some indication of the tax treatment of those transactions. Um, this builds on the success that the IRS had in prior years with the offshore um, financial account. 
um, and the checkbox on Schedule B, which was very effective not only in reminding people that if they've got off offshore bank accounts, they need to be reporting that for tax purposes um, and for financial reporting purposes on their FBARs. Um, so building on the success of that um, program and that, that, that reporting, um, the idea was to have some indication here on a checkbox, uh, both on the front end, as I said, to remind taxpayers and their advisors that this is something that needs to be reported, and also on the back end. Um, the cases that are working their way through the system right now with foreign financial accounts, um, there are serious consequences to not checking that box when you do have a foreign financial account um, or checking it inaccurately. Um, so obviously if we can get this checkbox on there and people are not wanting to make a good faith effort to report their transactions in virtual currency, um, a mistake or misstatement in how they check that box could have some very serious consequences down the road. So the reporting success we've seen with that, we're hoping to replicate um, also in the area of virtual currency. Uh, but I think more importantly, or perhaps as importantly, um, on the front end to give us a better sense of how prevalent um, virtual currency transactions are. It can sometimes be kind of hard to see exactly where on a tax return somebody might be reporting this. So a checkbox will give us a much better sense of exactly how prevalent these transactions are in the economy. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I mentioned that we are addressing virtual currency from two fronts, one on the guidance front up front, and then on the enforcement front as well, and I'll talk about both of them. Um, the issue of virtual currency, and I sort of equate this to some of my prior experiences, but it's something that I think we are obligated to try to give guidance on, um, like any other emerging area in the economy. Um, and I just think back to some of my prior experiences um, in tax administration, and in particular, um, a recollection of, of working when I was at Treasury on the issue of derivative contracts and the tax treatment, and an emerging issue um, not in anywhere near the same degree of virtual currency, but how uh, derivative contracts, and in particular exchange traded notes, should be reported for tax purposes. Um, so a hearing we held back in 2007 or 2008, I believe, with the Ways and Means Committee talked about this emerging area of derivative contracts. And the discussion then was this sort of cubbyhole concept that you've got this emerging area in the economy, um, and we need, from a tax administration perspective, to fit that into an existing reporting and treatment regime. So the concept of what was called a cubbyhole there, we've got existing cubbyholes to take an emerging issue and put it into one of the existing cubbyholes. So um, from my perspective, that's very reminiscent of what we're doing now with virtual currency. Um, we have established protocols for treat tax treatment of a number of different issues and take something like virtual currency and find the right cubbyhole to put that in. Um, another sort of analogous situation might be something like the gig economy that we're talking about. Um, you know, emerging areas of the economy, and we try to see how those fit into um, existing areas of tax law. Um, and sometimes the economy can evolve faster than the tax law does. And in the gig economy context, we've got rules that were written many, many years ago about service arrangements and trying to fit gig economy arrangements into those um, somewhat older uh, established tax paradigms this can sometimes present some challenges. So virtual currency I see is analogous to, to those examples as well. This is an emerging area of the economy. We need to find a cubby hole that this can fit into um, and then give guidance on that and look to enforcement. And guidance in that context can of course be evolving. Congress can think about the way this should be treated and change the tax law, the tax code. And we can also think about um, you know, ways that we can modify existing rules to accommodate um, the reporting and compliance in areas like virtual currency or derivative contracts or the gig economy. So um, it's not an unusual exercise for us, but in each of those illustrations does present some, yeah, some, some challenges. So with that sort of cubbyhole approach, going back to 2014, and I know a number of my colleagues who worked on the 2014 notice um, are here with us today, um, but we answered a basic cubbyhole question. Um, where does virtual currency go? And the answer we said at the time in notice 2014-21 was that virtual currency should be treated as property for tax purposes. Um, the tax treatment of property is well established in the code and in case law and in regulations. So once you call it property, um, even today from our perspective, you answer most, if not all, of the basic questions about how virtual currency transactions should be reported for tax purposes. Um, there's still a lot of complexities and uncertainty just about your, arising from the nature of virtual currency. 
but that gives you a very well-established tax paradigm in which to take virtual currency and put it on a tax return, and certainly to make a good faith effort to put that on a tax return, um, given, of course, the complexities, and we'll talk about some of those and exactly how those go. Um, so the way I think about it, um, and this is perhaps a little bit elementary, and I was talking to Mark at a range for this as well, the analogy I thought of in this property paradigm and how it fits in um, is back to the issue of like Dutch tulips. And so you've got this issue of property, and you know if you're walking around using Dutch tulips as something that people are accepting as um, an exchange for services or property or, or, or coffee for that matter, um, there is an established tax treatment for that. It may be somewhat unusual that your coffee shop accepts Dutch tulips in exchange for a cup of coffee, um, but the tax treatment is fairly well established. Uh, Mark gave me another analogy of slices of gold. If you can take a gold bar and walk into your coffee shop and slice off a little piece of that to pay for coffee, um, that's an interesting way to pay for coffee, but there's an established tax treatment for that. A gold bar is a piece of property and the tax laws tell you what to do when you've got a slice of gold that you're using to pay for a cup of coffee. Um, it's a recognition event and there are established tax consequences to doing that. Um, so all of that sort of leads to a conclusion that a lot of the uncertainty is not necessarily uncertainty in the tax treatment of property transactions, but it's uncertainty arising from the unique factual nature of transacting in slices of, Dutch, uh, of, of gold bars or in Dutch tulips or in virtual currency. Um, so that's ambiguity, perhaps, or uncertainty that arises from the unique factual nature and evolving factual nature of those transactions. It's not necessarily uncertainty in what we do with the tax treatment of property transactions. Um, so that's sort of some very high-level perspective on that, and recognizing that 2014 was now five years ago. Um, I think virtual currency has been evolving in the economy rapidly since then. Um, and we've gotten a number of comments in response to the request for comments in notice 2014-21 um, and have been considering those long before I got to the Office of Chief Counsel and certainly since then. Um, as I said, I think the issue of defining it as property answers most of the basic questions and gives everyone the ability to make a good faith effort to report their transactions on a tax return. But there are still some open questions, and we've heard many of them, as I said, in response to comments uh, submitted in, in, in connection with notice 2014-21. Um, so we did, as you all know, just issue um, Revenue Ruling 2019-24 and a set of frequently asked questions that went with it. Um, I think the frequently asked questions and the format for that, from our perspective, are simply giving illustrations of application of well-established tax law to a set of facts involving transactions in virtual currency. Um, so the FAQs do not, by definition, break any new ground. Um, they just give helpful illustrations of how established tax law should be applied to transactions in virtual currency. Um, the revenue ruling itself answers one of many questions that were presented to us, um, the issue of a hard fork and the tax treatment of a hard fork. Um, I know that there are many other questions out there, and even in response to the revenue ruling, folks have said, well, you answered only one question. There are many more out there, um, and those are on our plate for consideration. I think the notice, or I'm sorry, the revenue ruling itself raised a number of other questions about how people understand terms like what an airdrop is, um, and there doesn't seem to be complete uniformity in the industry as to what some of that terminology means. So we are certainly, from a tax perspective, trying to understand that. Um, and if people have different views on how we frame things and characterize them in the FAQs or the revenue ruling, we certainly want to hear that and have heard that from many people. Um, so the revenue rulings out there, the FAQs are out there. Um, we have, as I said, a, a long list of other questions that we are looking to address. Um, many of them I put in the area of reporting and compliance, um, and I think that illustrates the basic point that there aren't unanswered questions about how you treat transactions in property, um, but there are unique sort of compliance related issues. You know, how do you come up with the value? What's the basis in your property that you are transacting and if it's virtual currency? Um, estate planning considerations. I saw an article recently that raised all sorts of questions about estate planning considerations. Um, so those questions are out there and those are very important questions for us and I think something we can work to give additional guidance on, but it is in the area of exactly how you get these transactions onto a tax return. Um, and as I said when I opened, and I'll reiterate, um, much of the problem that we've seen is not people wrestling with exactly what their basis should be um, or exactly how to value issues, which isn't per se a tax issue. 
Um, but it's just transactions not showing up on a tax return at all. Um, so I think once you get it onto the tax return, we can certainly work with taxpayers and want to work with taxpayers to figure out exactly what should be on the tax return. But the biggest problem for us is that it's not showing up on a tax return at all. Um, so to some extent, when you dive down into the, the, the discrete issues of basis computation and should it be specific identification or average, you know, we want to be helpful on that front, but it would be great if we can get these transactions on a tax return to begin with. And that's really the compliance challenge that we see and I think the greatest threat um, presented to us by, by virtual currency transactions is this, these transactions not ending up on the tax return at all. Um, and I think that sort of pivots to one area that's probably our next big focus for guidance in this context. Um, we just put out on October 8th the new priority guidance plan and identify there um, an item that we are um, thinking about for information reporting under Section 6045. Um, we've already had folks come in and meet with us on that, and we're certainly looking to get more comments on that. Um, but that's probably our next big push is to get information reporting. Um, it's no mystery that when you have any kind of information reporting, your level of compliance increases dramatically. Um, so even if it's just gross proceeds reporting, um, that will, we think, increase compliance dramatically. And that's why that's the really next focus of our guidance, um, keeping in mind many other questions that have come up. So I think my time is a little bit limited, and I just want to be sure I don't um, uh, step down without addressing some of the enforcement issues. Um, you all know that we sent out about 10,000 letters earlier this year um, that I think are a very clear indication that on the exam front and on the business unit front, the IRS is very focused on virtual currency transactions, has a lot of information out there about virtual currency transactions, even without basic 1099 information reporting. And there will be an increasing level of audit activity in this area. So stay tuned for more on that front. Um, as I said, even without 1099s, there are lots of sources for information for the IRS. Um, some exchanges are giving us 1099s. Um, we've had a John Doe summons. Others are under consideration. So there are many, many sources for information for the IRS um, to pursue enforcement activity. Um, as I said, we had the checkbox on the um, 1040 as well. Um, that's been, I guess, the draft 1040 now. So we expect that to lead to more information as well. Um, and we also have um, the traditional source of just getting more information, which is just routine audits. Um, and there have been a number of virtual currency transactions that have been picked up through routine examination um, efforts, and we expect those to continue as well. Um, I do want to mention very briefly, without getting into the specifics, there is criminal investigation activity in this area as well. Um, I think just yesterday, um, CI uh, was part of a big press release about some really dark criminal activity having to do with transactions in virtual currency. Um, that's not tax per se, although it originated with the CI investigation, um, but CI is very active in this area and will continue to be. So uh, another very important part of our enforcement activity. Um, so I think with that, um, I will, I think my time is about up, but as I said, I'm really here to try to get some questions from you. Um, I cannot guarantee and probably won't give many answers to all of the pending questions, but the questions alone are quite helpful for us and we'll try to um, take those back and make sure that we're, we're listening to you in these contexts as well. So there's a mic for two microphones in the back, so if folks have questions, please uh, raise your hand and we'll um, choose it over here on the left, far left, your right. Uh, thank you, I'm uh, Jameson Seitz with RSM. First, thank you for giving out the guidance. It's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> really appreciate the effort there. FinCEN recently came out with a letter, some guidance to, in a letter to the AICPA, right. clarifying that cryptocurrency would not be required on the FBAR. Can we expect any guidance with regards to specific uh, foreign asset reporting? Yeah, I mentioned that the 6045 reporting is probably the highest, highest priority for us in information reporting. Um, but we have been speaking with FinCEN, um, and it's not only the FBAR reporting, which is very important, but also um, FATCA reporting, and people have brought to our attention questions about FATCA reporting. Um, I, I think that is a particularly important area going forward because we certainly recognize that without the, the, the international reporting, um, there could be a trend to move some of these transactions offshore, and that's not a trend that we would want to encourage. So reporting on FBARs, reporting on, on FATCA is something we're very focused on. Um, that, that's a different lift than 6045 reporting, and we've got to consider our authority 
um, to require that. And FinCEN is obviously an FBAR reporting, not Title 26, so we need to carefully coordinate that with, with FinCEN. Uh, but those discussions are well underway. We've had a number of conversations with them, and I expect those to continue. So, so do stay tuned for, for more news on that front as well from, from us and our sister agencies. Hi, I'm Lisa Zarlinga from Steptoe and Johnson. Um, I just wanted to ask the the hard fork guidance that you mm -hmm. guys released was in the form of a revenue ruling. Right. Um, I know the ABA had filed comments sort of indicating that there are reasonable positions to be taken on both sides of the hard fork issue, um, but a revenue ruling suggests that it applies retroactively, um, which would mean that taxpayers have to go back and file amended returns for some of the high profile forks that have occurred. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if any um, penalty relief or any other kind of guidance might be under consideration for the, for taxpayers that find themselves in those positions. Yeah, and, and, and we're certainly aware of that. I, I just, it is a revenue ruling and taxpayers are entitled to rely on that. So if they report consistently with that, um, that's something that will not be challenged. Um, in, in terms of the retroactive effect, it's, it's not binding on taxpayers, it's binding on the IRS like any other internal revenue ruling guidance. Um, so it's certainly a statement of the IRS's interpretation of existing law, and in that respect, you could see it as retroactive because we think that's what the law is always provided for. Um, the issue of amended returns and what to do there, I think that's something that every taxpayer needs to consult with their advisors on if they've got a significant issue there. Um, there is a procedure for qualified amended returns if somebody has a very large reporting position that they're concerned with. Um, there's no statutory requirement to file amended returns. There are obviously consequences if you've got an error on your returns of not doing that, um, and penalty consequences, which you mentioned as well. Um, so I, I think that is certainly something for us to consider. Um, anything that we can do to encourage broader compliance, and if somebody's put something on a tax return and it's just a matter of exactly how they reported the hard fork, um, that's going to be something we would want to work with people on, as opposed to not getting it on the tax return at all. Um, that would be a, a, certainly a, a more significant issue and, and from a taxpayer's perspective, more concerning in, in terms of penalties and consideration of qualified amended returns. So um, exactly how we would provide for that, um, I think it's certainly something we could consider and happy to hear um, how prevalent that issue might be and whether it's something that we should be considering putting guidance out on. Um, so I hadn't heard specifically about the penalty relief. I think that kind of issue of, of safe harbors was certainly discussed extensively internally. And as I said, the people that are trying to report and have been trying to report in good faith are people we want to work with. Um, and it's the folks that didn't do anything at all in terms of reporting you know, significant transactions that we would be more concerned with. I'm getting questions from all the people that worked on the old guidance here. So yeah, 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 yeah. Very constructive questions, I'll recognize. But. And and this is not with respect to the old guidance at all. Because um, <laughs> I'd ask you that question then. <laughs> my practice focuses primarily on the civil side, uh -huh. but I've noted um, uh, with um, alarm that on the FBAR question on the 1040, Title 31 criminal willfulness has uh -huh. been used um, both in situations where one might read the case and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense, and also in cases where folks are reading the case law and saying, wow, I missed that question on line seven of a schedule, and now I'm subject to criminal prosecution. So I'm wondering what the IRS, if the IRS has a view or has thought about the Title 26 application of not filling out mm -hmm. the answer to the question, the new question on the 1040. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, anytime you're talking about criminal cases or even civil fraud cases, it's going to be extremely fact specific. So it's hard to say in any particular case, you know, those turn on specific intent of a taxpayer um, or, you know, their state of mind and those kinds of issues. So I don't think there's anything generally that can be said about the failure to check a box when you should have or checking it incorrectly. Um, certainly from a Title 26 perspective, we do have, um, you know, civil fraud cases that are coming out of those foreign account reporting um, issues as well. So, um, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think I can say anything generically about, you know, what the consequence of that is. It's going to depend 
you know, very much on the facts of a particular case as any criminal or civil fraud case is going to do. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Anybody has them? Right here in front. Yeah. As you know, when Facebook went up on the Hill to talk about Libra, there was quite a, uh, shall I say, there was some alarm among the lawmakers that there's not a regulatory framework. Any thought about, of course, the Libra project is going through a lot of mm -hmm. difficulties at the moment, but any thought on how long it will actually take to have sort of a regulatory framework in place, sort of a full, full, full blown framework? And also, would, would you address uh, the, um, your thoughts on whether Congress or the IRS, mm -hmm. whether Congress would have to do a law to require the 199K filing mandatory by the exchanges, or could, could, could that be uh, regulated? Right. So I, I think two questions there. Um, in terms of the framework, from a tax perspective, as I mentioned, the, two, the 2014 notice said this is property. There is a framework for the tax treatment of property. Um, it's a well-established framework. Um, so I'm not sure from a tax perspective that there is a framework that's needed in that area. I think what you're talking about is sort of a broader non-tax regulatory framework that I'm obviously not going to speak on. So um, we have received inquiries from Congress on the tax treatment and letters have come in. Um, so we're obviously working to issue guidance like the revenue ruling in response to not only the questions from all of you, but also from congressional inquiries. And it's incumbent upon us to answer that from a tax perspective. Um, in terms of information reporting, obviously a threshold question when we look at the 6045 reporting and identify that on the priority guidance plan. Threshold question is what is our authority? Can we do this? Um, so we need to get comfortable with that in any side of sort of reporting that we require. Um, but we've identified that as a priority guidance item and we certainly think we have some authority to require something. Um, uh, we anticipate putting something out there for people to comment on, and that's something that they can comment on. Um, but we think we have some authority to require some reporting, which is why we put that on the priority guidance plan. And what that is, um, you'll see something further when that priority guidance plan project is, is published. One more question up front here. Hi, Allie from Bloomberg Tax. Uh, I wanted to ask, is there anything that you think Congress needs to act on first before the IRS issues guidance on it? Um, I'm going to speak from the position of chief counsel, which is not to ask Congress what they should and shouldn't be doing. Um, I'll leave that to my colleagues at the Treasury Department. Um, I will, I guess, echo the comment I just made to Alan, which is, you know, we think there is an established framework for the tax treatment of property. Um, and we're moving forward under that established framework. If Congress chooses to ch change that framework, we'll obviously um, react to that. Um, but we do not propose legislative changes. Um, our colleagues at the Treasury Department do that. Um, as I have said before, um, someone else decides where the trains are going and we just try to help make sure the trains are running, so. Okay. Well, join me in thanking Mike Desmond Thanks, Mark. for Thank you informative uh, discussion. Now, welcome, you guys up. Good morning. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to follow Mike Desmond. Thank you so much uh, for your comments and. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Kristen Smith. I'm the director of the Blockchain Association. Uh, we are a trade association based here in Washington, DC, and we work exclusively on federal public policy issues that impact the crypto industry. So I'll be speaking today from that perspective. Uh, just quick, oops, wrong way. There we go. Um, just quickly about, on our membership, uh, we have 21 members of the Blockchain Association. It's uh, the players in the industry that are exclusively working in the cryptocurrency space. We represent projects that have built or are building uh, a system that uses cryptocurrency. We represent cryptocurrency exchanges, the types that uh, you know may in the future be doing 1099-style reporting, and um, also early-stage investors. 
So a question we often get, especially um, when speaking with regulators, but often on Capitol Hill, is to talk about, uh, we get the question, what is a cryptocurrency? And uh, the folks at the Tax Policy Center have asked me today to focus my comments on that in order to kind of level set the discussion for um, everybody here in the room. So the, the problem with asking what is a cryptocurrency is it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you understand uh, the context in what they, in, in, within which they operate. Um, and so I think the right question, the first question to address is what is an open blockchain network? Once you understand what an open blockchain network is, then understanding um, the role of cryptocurrency in that network will make much more sense. So there's a term that's thrown around quite a bit um, in, in the crypto world. It's this term of, uh, this concept of decentralization. And so when you're looking at an open blockchain network, what we're really trying to do is take what we see on the um, left here, which is sort of the way we transact today, where if I want to give Mike $5 um, and I want to do it via Venmo or some other app, it goes to, to uh, my bank, which talks to his bank, which goes to him. Um, by decentralizing that middleman, um, you end up with a system uh, on the right, which doesn't seem to be coming through super clearly, I apologize, um, where you're able to transact directly without having to have a centralized organization in the middle. Um, but you still have to have that service that's performed in the middle, right? So th it doesn't totally go away. There has to be something that records the transaction um, and, and that offers the hardware and the software uh, that enables um, the, the transaction to take place. And so what we do is we, um, and if you look at a traditional service today, um, what, what do they have, right? And, and I'm talking here um, both about financial services, but also digital services. For example, like a social networking service or a file storage service or something of that nature. What do all of those types of digital services have in common? They have large servers at a server farm that um, in many cases run proprietary software and then they keep records. They have data um, or records. With an open blockchain network, we eliminate the, the centralized organization and bring together individuals or small businesses that utilize um, their own hardware. They run common set um, of open source software. And then this is where the blockchain comes in. The blockchain is the, the, the mechanism of record keeping where all of these computers are talking to each other and have a common set of records. And by decentralizing it in that way, you don't have to have one single centralized entity in the middle that's doing all of that. Um, so I'm a minimalist, and this one on the left looks like a lot simpler and easier and more efficient than than the one on the right. That was sort of my initial thought when I looked at this. But there, there's some very good reasons why we're trying to decentralize these centralized services. Um, real quickly, these are just a couple of the benefits, but there are many others. Uh, these open blockchain networks are much more secure than a traditional centralized service. If, if part of the network goes down, the whole network doesn't go down because there's redundancies and it can keep working. Um, there are also business models that enable consumer privacy to be built into that model. So instead of having a social networking service that makes money by collecting all of your data and selling it to advertisers, you could pay little small amounts of cryptocurrency in order to access that service without having to give away all of your information. So these type of networks enable these privacy-focused models. Um, it also helps with competition issues. Um, banking is, is fairly consolidated, but it's really when you look at the internet services where there have been advantages to having a large scale. And so um, with open blockchain networks, it's easier for groups of players to come together and build something that's bigger and better and can compete with these internet services. So these are all really good public policy issues um, and uh, consumer issues that we want to solve. And so that's why it's worth going through this process of uh, you know, going from the one kind of centralized organization to the decentralized organization. Um, so where does the crypto come in with all of this, right? So we have these networks. They're doing things uh, better, faster, cooler than these centralized services. Um, 
So the cryptocurrency is the fuel for this entire thing to work. If you think about it, and you don't have this centralized organization, you need, you need something that allows all of these processes to be more automatic and to incentivize different players to come to the table. Um, so just a couple of uh, reasons why the cryptocurrency is needed is, one, it actually um, works within the network because it is software itself. And so it interacts with the network. If you think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is probably the most simple example of an open blockchain network is out there. It's, it's really just recording the transfer of value from one place to another. But as you get into more advanced cases that are being developed today and look towards the future, there are going to be additional complexities that that, that service requires. And the cryptocurrency can monitor and make sure that the service level agreement that that service is supposed to provide is met and transact um, only once that is met without having to have um, you know, sort of a team of, of people watching to make sure that the service is, is completed. It's, it's built into the code. Um, it also allows for enhanced payment. So today, it's very difficult. Um, I, I think I paid $25 a month for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, sometimes I, I want to read an article, and I don't have a subscription, and I get cranky, and I have to go find somebody to you know, email me a PDF copy of it. Um, th there could be a future where if you want to access content, you just pay a little micropayment. Maybe you pay a penny to read an article, or a couple pennies, or maybe a tenth of a penny. And these types of mic these micropayments aren't possible today because of the swipe fees with credit card companies and transactions. So the fact that you can utilize micropayments could open up a whole host of innovation in, in digital services that will lead to things that will benefit consumers, um, again, in a way that doesn't require them to hand over all of their data. Um, also, I think very importantly, cryptocurrencies are an incentive for individuals to contribute to the network. So we don't have a single company that's running an open blockchain network. What we have are uh, different companies or even individuals who are contributing their energy, their hardware, uh, running this open so source software um, in order to make the network function and work. People aren't going to do that unless there is an incentive there. And um, so those who utilize the service will pay with the cryptocurrency those that offer the service will get paid with the cryptocurrency. So it's really important to have a functioning, a healthy market of exchanges so people can get in and out of positions with different kinds of cryptocurrencies. Um, I guess what I will leave with uh, before we get into our panel discussion here is that, um, as, as Mike said, the key takeaway in all of this is that virtual currency, the current framework that we use, is that it is treated as property. And that triggers all sorts of implications. Most um, importantly is that we look to the future. And one that we think about a lot is um, as we move to sort of this cryptocurrency world we live in today, where most people um, are just sort of buying and holding it, and it's kind of almost a novelty, that's going to change incredibly rapidly. And we're going to go from a place where um, we, we, you know, hold a little bit in a, in a wallet to where we're transacting, often sometimes maybe without even consciously thinking about it, on, a, on a multiple times a day, over and over and over with cryptocurrency. And calculating capital gains taxes at every turn is going to become a much more complex headache over time. And so I can say that at the Blockchain Association, especially with our exchange members, we're, we're spending a lot of time. We've been speaking with the IRS and the folks at at Treasury and thinking about how can we make this easier for consumers to meet their obligations, um, but also do we need to have a change in the policy that will enable this technology to take off so that we can have all of the benefits that it can offer that consumers want um, without having to have um, a massive uh, tax headache uh, come, come tax day. Um, Anyway, with that, I'd like to invite the rest of the panelists up, and we will have a, a get back to tax policy and, and have a more detailed discussion. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katanga Johnson. I'm a financial 
regulation correspondent at Reuters, based here in DC, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Joining me is someone you've heard from already, Kristen Smith, who's the director of the Blockchain Association. We have Nathan Rigney, who's the lead tax research analyst of the Tax Institute at H&R Block, and Mark Mazur, who's the Robert C. Posen director here at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Um, before we begin the conversation, I just thought to ask our panelists just to share brief opening remarks. Um, yeah, um, as I said before, my name is Kristen Smith. I run the Blockchain Association. Um, my background is um, public policy. I was on the Hill for 10 years and, and worked as a lobbyist. I'm Nathan Rigney with the Tax Institute at H&R Block. Uh, and we have we did about 23 million returns through our tax software just in the last fiscal year, and so that gives us a, a unique perspective on uh, how new economic trends uh, really affect tax compliance issues for just the average American um, uh, client that we have, and certainly cryptocurrency is one of those issues. Uh, you know, some of the tax law questions have been answered uh, through this guidance issued by the IRS. But certainly, even just average sort of casual cryptocurrency users have some serious practical problems reporting uh, basis and uh, valuation issues as well. And so uh, information reporting certainly could, could help solve that problem. And, and we've seen, uh, you know, we, we have history of looking at, you know, 2011, I think it was, when basis had to start being reported on 1099Bs and how that just really helped taxpayers who had stock sales uh, come into a com uh, really save time uh, in compliance when they reported those stock sales on their returns. So uh, keeping in mind that, of course, that added a significant expense to, uh, to the brokerage firms who had to track that basis and report it, uh, it certainly saved taxpayers a significant amount of time and money during tax season. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Mark Mazur. I uh, just wanted to uh, elaborate a little bit on the, the uh, point Mike Desmond made about my mental model for, for cryptocurrency. And, and I sort of have this idea of digital gold bars. And so it really is like slicing off little, little segments of gold bars and using them at the, at the coffee shop or, or to invest or to do whatever you want with it. And one of the things that's interesting about cryptocurrencies is just that becoming more and more prevalent in routine transactions. And so it really is incumbent on the tax authorities to begin to understand what the consequences are and how to, to address them. I think, as, as Mike said, there's you know, millions of people who um, engage in cryptocurrency transactions. And you know, he didn't quite say zero, but not, not a whole lot bigger than zero of people who are reporting them on their returns. And so um, that's a challenge. And what the IRS has done so far is work on the educational side to say, here are the rules of the road, here's what you should be doing, here's how it should be reported, um, putting out guidance, putting out information, educational documents, and so on. Um, and now they're beginning kind of a, a second step, which is uh, on your tax form, check a box whether you have cryptocurrency transactions. That will certainly uh, elevate uh, people's attention for how to deal with this. And you know, when you go to do your taxes, if you're using software like H&R Block or TurboTax, there'll be a question, do you have uh, virtual currency transactions? And you'll answer yes or no. And if you're doing this in person um, with a preparer, they'll go through and ask you that question and there'll be like a moment of reckoning. Okay, well, do I have these transactions and then what do I do with them? Um, and it's incumbent on IRS to, uh, and Treasury to figure out what the rules of the road are going to be going forward. I think if, if Kristen's correct and people start doing dozens of microtransactions a day, um, it's going to be very difficult for people to you know, keep track of those and, and add them up. Um, and that really is the challenge. We're looking at a fast evolving technology and trying to figure out what are the tax rules that are going to be helpful in, in accommodating those, those technological changes. So Mike Desmond did talk a bit about some of the decision making uh, leading up to the 2014 guidance. But Kristen, I'm curious on how much from the industry perspective has changed since the 2014 guidance to the most recent? Yeah, so crypto um, as, a, as a concept in an industry has been around uh, a little just, uh, I guess, almost 11 years now. It was on, on Halloween in, in 2009 when the um, Bitcoin white paper was released to the world, and then it was in um, early 2000, uh, or I'm sorry, I guess it was 2008, and then early 2009. Um, when uh, the, the Bitcoin network went live. And, and for the first couple of years, it was really 
um, it was really just just Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum then came out, but but what we have seen since then is now there are, uh, depending on different estimates, um, you know, anywhere between two and three thousand different cryptocurrencies that are out there. Um, many of those were part of uh, sort of this ICO craze in 2017. Um, and have sort of uh, now become useless today. Um, but the industry has gotten much more complex, um, also much more professional. There are these, there's a, um, if, if you are a computer scientist getting your PhD right now, or if you're in a venture capital and tech, you're thinking about crypto, because this is where uh, those folks see the future of um, not just financial services, but as I said before, um, you know, online digital services. And so it's, um, it's gone from, um, you know, what was sort of kind of a, a novelty hobbyist type of a, a small group um, to now we have, you know, 8% of uh, adults in the U.S. that own some cryptocurrency. So I think we are still in, in the scheme of things in the relatively early stages. Um, email was invented in 1972, and most of us didn't use it till the late 90s. And so this, this is, um, it, it's still difficult and complex to, to interact with them. But I, th I think as looking forward, that's going to start changing rapidly. And Nathan, I'd pose the same question to you. What do you feel are some of the changes that you've seen since the 2014 guidance? Well, so, so certainly, I think uh, we didn't see as many questions as we would have expected to see uh, after that guidance came out. And you can sort of take two guesses there. On the one hand, I think there was a, a, an understanding among a lot of users that uh, these transactions were perhaps more anonymous than they, than they actually are. And then that they're, you know, when IRS releases guidance, it puts the, the tax industry on notice, certainly. It, it puts uh, tax professionals on notice. But the, the, the cryptocurrency holders um, just may not have been aware still. So there was a significant level of, of just a lack of awareness. Um, since then, certainly with this year, with all the letters coming out, there's just so much activity from the IRS. There's a lot of uh, information going around in the news. Um, so now there's a significantly higher level of awareness. And the other sort of, you know, w when, when the white paper came out, I think the expectation was that this really would be used as a payment network. And over time, it, it really developed into uh, more of an investment vehicle. And so as that happened and, and the increase in value, right? I, I think just little attention was paid. And then once the, the, the value really started increasing, it really caught the attention of the IRS. And uh, you know, that's the most significant change. It's just the increase in value, the increase of adoption, and then uh, what that means from a tax perspective, just driving all these new tax, con tax consequences that taxpayers really have to pay attention to. You mentioned a few things there, but I, I kind of just wanted to sort of look at how when you think about the IRS's education and compliance efforts at large, what are some things you've heard from like uh, cryptocurrency purchasers and investors about those efforts specifically? We'll talk about the letters and other things uh, later in the conversation. Yeah, you know, it's, it's similar to, uh, so a lot of these folks, this is the first time they've been engaged in uh, investment activities. These are our clients, right? So we're, we're talking about some, some casual cryptocurrency investors. Um, maybe they've bought and sold stocks, but, but they, they have this feeling like it really it shouldn't be shouldn't be generating tax uh, uh, liability, and so I think that that initial conversation that that education of well here's how property law property tax law works, uh, and here is you know what's happening with these transactions and, and you really do have a, a tax liability being generated, um, you know I, I think. That's sort of the, the initial conversation that we're having. And then when you get past that, it, if there becomes a question of, hey, someone has uh, income generated from mining activity, which now we're, we're seeing you know, less of. I don't think there are a lot of just sort of uh, casual, um, certainly not on the Bitcoin blockchain, not a, not a lot of casual uh, uh, mining activity going on. But the question there would be about whether they're in a trader business. And then, of course, the consequences of having this income that's generated in a trader business and being treated as uh, a small business owner and having to pay self-employment tax. Um, just some really unexpected tax outcomes for, for people who are engaged in this new economic activity. 
uh, that they didn't see as fitting in well with sort of existing uh, tax law. And Kristen, you've been a part of those conversations with the IRS about their education and compliance efforts, I imagine. What, in your view, how, do you, how would you characterize those efforts? Well, we've, um, we've only recently begun um, engaging with the IRS uh, more as just a matter of uh, triaging uh, public policy issues. Um, and, you know, as, uh, um, you know, as representing the industry, um, I think the industry wants to see that, um, you know, they want to be good actors in this space, at least, at least the folks that are in the U.S. Um, that are operating here and have a have a, have a large presence, and, and they want to be um, as helpful uh, as they can be in that process within reason. And um, uh, in our recent discussions uh, with folks at the IRS, they've been uh, they've had wonderful questions. They've been um, very open, and um, I think from our perspective, we're trying to figure out what is the role of industry in helping their users and consumers comply. Because you know, it's it's uh, better for the whole ecosystem if it becomes easier for this to do um, and and not kind of associated with uh, you know folks that are dodging taxes and um, so I think over time um, uh, you know we'll see that number tick up quite a mm -hmm. bit and um, it's you know but it just takes it does take awareness and it's not always intuitive to folks right away and I think in other types of investments people are used to getting something in the mail at the end of the year that like jogs their memory that they need to pay taxes on this. So as I think as we move forward, we can find solutions for that, but it's um, not a quick and easy fix. Mm. Uh, during your presentation, you talked a bit about uh, exchanges, cryptocurrency exchanges. What kinds of entities are those, and do they tend to specialize in cryptocurrency only? And then could you also talk a bit about what types of regulations they're subject to? For example, like the reporting requirements. Yeah, so, it, so in the crypto industry, when we use the term exchanges, uh, that is uh, just sort of the common common term. These these are really platforms that allow for the trading of cryptocurrency, and so they're not um, exchanges as um, might be you know registered with the SEC. In in many cases, these are specific companies that don't trade securities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they specialize in cryptocurrencies because there are all sorts of additional. Um, regulatory requirements required for the trading of securities. Uh, there are there are some companies that um, uh, that offer both services, but for the most part, um, these are companies that specialize in in allowing people to go either from you know fiat currency to a particular cryptocurrency or from one type of cryptocurrency mm -hmm. to the other. Um, as I mentioned before, though, you don't have to trade cryptocurrency through an exchange. You can transact directly with someone. Um, there are, there are uh, different wallet providers out there that just allow you to sort of store it and you can you know, share your address with somebody and they can, you, know, you can receive cryptocurrency that way. So you don't actually have to be um, on an exchange wallet in order to transact, but I think for your average consumer, that's where a lot of them go um, in order to access the system. Right. And then what kinds of regulations are they subject to? Um, so a lot, actually. I think it's a it's a, a, a misconception that crypto is unregulated because it is it is very regulated. It's obviously um, the, the Treasury Department were um, some of the early uh, uh, thinkers on how to think about regulation. So uh, FinCEN within Treasury, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, requires um, anti money laundering programs and know your customer um, programs. The um, the SEC sometimes steps into the fray um, because, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, to, to get to these decentralized networks, you have, oftentimes have to start out with something much more centralized. And when you have a, a centralized type of an organization, there are information asymmetries with investors, and so it's appropriate for securities laws to apply. Mm -hmm. Over time, that changes, and so uh, sometimes the industry uh, bumps into securities laws uh, for derivatives of cryptocurrencies, the CFTC comes in. Uh, states, um, state money transmitter license laws apply. And so depending on um, the type of player or actor within the industry, there are um, quite a few regulations that apply. And as long as we're explaining, I have to ask, Nathan, could you help us understand what actually is a fork and why do we care about it for tax purposes? <laughs> so, so for tax purposes, uh, okay, so a fork is, is when you have uh, a split from a, a, a blockchain. And so now you have 
two blockchains and the new blockchain and a hard fork, you have a new cryptocurrency associated with the, the new blockchain. And the, the, you know, the new guidance addressed what happens when you receive a cryptocurrency in, in that situation, a new cryptocurrency. Um, but there are some real valuation issues uh, that, that happen in that, in that situation. And I think, I think there's been, I'm sure Michael Desmond, your team has heard some pushback since that guidance came out. Uh, because while there may be, so you look to the, to the value of that new cryptocurrency at the time that it was, you know, as the guidance said, added to uh, the distributed ledger. And, and where you look for that valuation is, is tricky. It may be established, it may be that you can actually sell it for that value that, that you can find published on a, on a, a, a blockchain explorer or, or published on, a, on an exchange. Uh, but it may be that you would have trouble selling it, and it may be that it fluctuates in value um, a great deal after it, it, it uh, is received by the individual. But so there's, there's a real struggle there for, for all the folks who, um, who held Bitcoin in, uh, in 2017 when, when there was a fork from the, from the Bitcoin blockchain and, and everyone received a unit of Bitcoin cash for every uh, unit of Bitcoin that they held. And I think the value at the time was around $200 uh, at the time that people received this, uh, this unit of Bitcoin cash. And then the value fluctuated just enormously. And so if they didn't report it at that time, um, you know, they may feel like they uh, lost a great deal of value if they, if they sold it for less. Now I think it's actually a little bit above uh, that value. But um, yeah, I mean, that's... There's a little bit of a struggle there, but as Michael Desmond said, the, the tax law portion of it, we understand. It's more of the practical problem of how do you value it. And I think there will be some legal arguments made that uh, some of the value, I think there needs to be a good, a good faith effort to report it. And then I think there will be some back and forth with the IRS and then possibly uh, the tax court will ultimately make some decisions on, on valuation mm -hmm. in these cases. So I have a question for each of you. Um, people who mine cryptocurrencies as a trade or business are subject to self-employment tax in addition to income tax. Uh, is this trade or business designation a topic of discussion within cryptocurrency centers or circles? And I think from, from, from my perspective, uh, sort of mining as a hobby, because that's really the, the discussion here is whether it's a trade or business right. or whether it's a hobby or, or merely some um, investment activity and you know if you're I think most of what we see is is someone makes an investment in some very specialized hardware and they do some research to make sure that um, that their their investment pays off and so they they have a profit motive they're they're operating if they're operating in a business like manner and they have a profit motive um, their tax advisors will, will get them to the right answer there. And I think, too, that, that the, the TCJA, the tax law that was passed um, in December of 2017, if they are operating as a hobby, if you, if you do go through the facts and circumstances and say, oh, no, they, they don't rise to the level of a trade or business, um, the income's still taxable. They don't have to pay self-employment tax, but they also can't deduct their expenses. And expenses for... Uh, anyone engaged in, in mining activities is going to be significant, uh, just the electricity involved and the specialized hardware. So, so it is a topic for, of discussion, though. And Kristen? Um, it, it comes up some, in some contexts. We don't represent um, at the Blockchain Association companies that are extensively involved in <coughs> mining, but um, it, it is something that is out there and that, that folks are thinking about. Um, and yeah, certainly on a professional scale, mm -hmm. you know, it makes sense, um, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I think we're going to see, um, I anticipate seeing um, more hobbyists or maybe um, folks that want to add some income and start doing this full time as these different networks start to launch and it's mm -hmm. not just, um, not just Bitcoin. I know there, there's always efforts to try to um, allow people to just use sort of common hardware devices. Um, if anybody watches Silicon Valley, this is kind of the theme of, of that show where it's like they're storing things in like refrigerator hard drives and things like that. Um, but I, th I think that, um, you know, I think that mining, um, um, yeah, it is something we think about. I'm not sure we have any 
perfect answers at this point, but it's, it's, it's definitely on the industry's radar. So I think one of the hard things here is getting taxpayers off of the, the, the zero point where they think this is an anonymous transaction that's not reported and it's somehow outside the traditional tax system. Mm -hmm. It's a brand new technology, it is disruptive, and I think people think of it as, well, it doesn't fit into any of the other boxes, so mm -hmm. it's this new thing, I don't really know what the treatment is, I won't do anything about it. Um, and I think that's moving the people from that to know this does fit into a context that's consistent with a uh, range of tax law and begin to report the information and, and to think about the tax consequences. So that's the biggest step, getting people from doing nothing to doing something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what, what, what the, the IRS is trying to, to do in a wide range of, of areas here. Um, I think the idea of the self-employment tax versus income tax, that's an interesting concept, but people report nothing now. So right. moving them to report something is kind of the, the, the bigger step. And then you can talk about, well, are you in a trader business or is it a hobby? Mm. Um, right now it, it's viewed as something that's completely outside of the, the normal income generating system. And then if you talk a little bit about like valuation and timing issues around using cryptocurrency mm -hmm. for wages, goods, and services, um, you know, the fair market value of a currency at the time of the exchange is important, but does this make it harder to accurately report and calculate tax liability than is the case when people use cash? Let's start with Kristen. Yeah, no, I know that um, uh, it's, it's common practice in the crypto industry for crypto companies to offer to pay a portion of salary in, in cryptocurrency. And the way that my understanding that the ones that I've talked to that do this is, um, you know, they're given the crypto, but the taxes are taken out on the front end. So it doesn't seem to be a huge barrier there. Um, I think the key is that, um, you know, the cash, the, the taxes are withheld, um, you know, sort of in US dollars and, and they do receive that crypto asset. Yeah, and so that, that payment for services example, as an employee, uh, the employer is going to be subject to the same withholding rules, the same w rules that they would otherwise. Um, there's just that conversion into US dollars that, that, that might be the issue. Um, there are services that, that do that for these employers. Uh, I, I don't know what, what employers are using, but certainly Ohio, for example, who is, who is accepting Bitcoin as payment for taxes for a short period of time, uh, they were using BitPay. And, and so there's, if there's a service provider that's sort of doing the conversion for you and then um, the withholding will all have to be in US dollars, of course, and then the employer will be uh, submitting the withholding. And so, so from that perspective, it's, it's just a matter of conversion, but, but I do think um, in some of these situations, you know, you, you, the guidance, for example, it says at the specific time, date and time, and I think the, the finding a good source that can give you a specific time, a, a value at any given time is difficult. And so an awful lot of people are, are, who are trying to comply, who are making a good faith effort, uh, are kind of stuck with a, a daily average. So what was the average price for that particular day? And for wages, that, that would be the appropriate use anyway. But for a uh, something where you, you, uh, you know, you pay for something, or, or rather you provide a service in exchange for um, a service like you sell coffee or, or you sell a good at a very specific date and time that you could track um, in exchange for cryptocurrency, the valuation would be a little bit trickier there. And I think right now you'd probably have to use a, a daily average. Uh, this makes sense, right? That's sort of what you would do in a normal business, right? If you were getting paid in tulips or mm -hmm. slices of gold, you would value it at, you know, what tulips sold for that day. So yeah. that's sort of the, the, the concept. I think the hard part is if there are lots of transactions over a period of time um, and the value is fluctuating over that time, then it's difficult for taxpayers to kind of keep track of each one of these. And I think, as Kristen said, if you're doing these micro, you know, one-tenth of a cent, um, the cost of calculating is got to be much greater than the, the amount that's being transferred. Yeah, and if you think about what this looks like to a taxpayer, uh, at the end of the year when they're trying, to, they're trying to gather their documents and they don't have this nice equivalent of a 1099B where they just, everything's laid out for them with all the, the information they need to correctly report it on a tax return. If, it's, if this is a, coming from an exchange, they can go download a, a CSV file and they can try to, you know, try to, try to match transactions and track basis that way. Uh, that, even knowing 
by law how it's how how we uh, are supposed to do that from a practical perspective if you don't have a software that's doing that for you it can just take you know hours and hours and hours of your time uh, so it's just kind of a, uh, a practical problem um, and then if you don't have uh, a nice CSV file if you don't even have that to go by you're you're really in trouble mm -hmm. so there is some good technology out there users you know Exchanges have access to some good technology uh, that, that they can collect this information and then uh, individual users or small businesses also have vendors that they can go to to solve some of these problems. Nathan, you referenced earlier when the IRS issued uh, educational letters to 10,000 uh, taxpayers about cryptocurrency reporting. Uh, many people were surprised that the IRS knew the identity of so many people who had made those transactions. My question is, how anonymous are cryptocurrency transactions? Perhaps so, we'll Kristen, do you want to you take yeah, this? Yeah. <laughs> not, not particularly anonymous. Um, they're you know, described as uh, pseudonymous in most cases. So if, um, if you're a customer and you go to Coinbase or Poloniex or Kraken or eToro and um, you, know, you want to, to sign up for an account, um, it, it's, you don't do that without getting your ID and your, all of your information and your photo to that exchange. So if you're on ramp to the crypto world as a, as a crypto exchange, they have information. Um, and if you recall, the, the blockchain, which records all of the data and all of the transactions, is publicly available. And the information that is recorded is, is sort of what people refer to as a public key. It's, it's a username. Um, and, um, and so, you know, it, nobody really knows precisely that it's Kristen Smith giving money to Katanga, but they'll know that my username is going to your username. And um, there are service providers that, you know, for the, the, on the law enforcement side of things that have um, built technology that really allows you to go in and get into the, the details of those. Um, I think where some of the complication arises on on um, you know the the reporting issues, and this is something that our our exchanges run into, is um, the exchanges don't always know um, what what's going on with wallets that are off their exchange, right? So um, they could get somebody that transfers money in, and they'll know their wallet that they control and who accesses that, but they don't know if if it's being transferred. Um, from somebody who's the same person, in which case that wouldn't be a taxable event at all, or a different person, um, or um, you know, at what price the cryptocurrency was purchased in that previous wallet. And so that's one of the challenges that when we talk about trying to figure out this, this reporting, um, there is a, there, there's a huge, a huge gap of information, and so it, it makes it very difficult for exchanges to accurately just give all of their customers a precise number to use. So I just wanted to yeah. segue into that well. <laughs> exactly. And, and what it looks like from the, the, the cryptocurrency user is that now they have, in the example where, you, where they uh, transfer a cryptocurrency from one exchange or one wallet to another wallet, and one wallet's on one exchange, the other wallet's on another exchange, that's going to require two CSVs, right? One CSV from one exchange, another one from another exchange, and then you're going to have to try to map those. So it's, it's complicated uh, whether you're an exchange trying to do that or whether you're an individual trying to do that. So it's just a real, real practical problem that, that, uh, that there are a lot of companies out there trying to solve. Uh, it's cer certainly marketing their services to, uh, to exchanges and some who are, who are marketing their services directly to uh, individuals. Along those same lines, where do you see room for like tax avoidance or evasion? And, and similarly, um, what activities or transactions do you expect the IRS to scrutinize? Yeah, I think, I think it, it seems that there might be an opportunity for a transferring, uh, you know, so transferring cryptocurrency for goods or services and significantly overpaying for those goods or services in order to perhaps get around uh, gift or state tax laws. Um, there's certainly just the, if there is not a good way to determine the value, um, or rather if, if, the, if the users especially think that these are, these are 
not happening on an exchange. And so they may not be very accessible. You can still go to a blockchain explorer and track an address if, if, if you found a way to tie an address to a, to a specific uh, real individual. Um, but that's, that can be very complicated. And I, so, so I think there's, there's opportunity to kind of load cash into a particular coin and then um, transfer wealth and, and make it look like a much smaller transaction than it really was. But there are some other ways to think about this too, right? So you can think about there being business to business transactions, consumer to business transactions, and consumer to consumer transactions. Uh, at the consumer to business level, we know that cash transactions get reported like half the time. Um, and so you'd sort of expect that cryptocurrency transaction to be in that similar range, right? So it'd be tax avoidance there where the coffee shop that took your Bitcoin forgot to report that as, as income. Um, in the consumer to consumer side, that's something that people probably ignore generally. But on the business to business side, this gets to Kristen's point about the paying wages in, in cryptocurrency. The rules are really clear and people know how to, to do them. And there are kind of economies of scale. If your company's paying you in cryptocurrency, paying you know, 1,000 employees, then they're doing that same thing 1,000 times. They kind of know how to do it. I think on the one-off transactions, that's where it's, where it's harder. And as you described, you know, there are possible planning things as well for maybe relatively rare transactions where, where taxpayers may try to, to skirt their, their obligations. And then I know a lot of the conversation so far has been about the IRS specifically, but are there other regulators in this space that each of you consider relevant? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I think the biggest issue for us at the Blockchain Association is getting clarity on securities law, as I mentioned. Um, that is uh, uh, an issue that is having very direct, um, uh, the uncertainty is having a very direct impact on uh, projects that were, you know, the idea was conceived here, people were educated here. Uh, but because of the uncertainty in the laws, they will leave the United States to launch that project, um, which is a really, really troubling trend. We, we also have um, uh, one example from a couple months ago, uh, Circle, which operates Poloniex, which is a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, when the SEC came out with guidance in April, they um, felt they needed to delist certain cryptocurrencies because they might actually indeed be securities. But in order to stay competitive internationally, um, they need to offer those. And so they have bifurcated their company and are moving people overseas um, to service their international business and giving um, less options to consumers here in the United States. So getting some more clarity on securities laws is for our members uh, the number one, two, and three issue. Um, and then the tax is a, is a close fourth behind. <laughs> yeah, and some of those some of those directly impact tax too. And so like the one in particular would be uh, if if someone comes in to govern um, valuation on exchanges or rather manipulation, price manipulation. Um, that will solve some of the valuation problems, or at least some of the legal arguments right now that, that will likely occur when we're debating the, the real value of some of the cryptocurrency that results from a, from a hard fork um, about, you know, was that a legitimate value or was that a value that was a result of mm -hmm. uh, potentially some, some bad actors who were uh, manipulating the market price. And so, yeah, as that comes into play, I think that that'll help uh, the valuation issue on the tax side as well. And I think this is a, there are other potential actors, right? So Federal Reserve has been talking about maybe doing something on cryptocurrency as a parallel to the actual um, fiat currency we have now. Um, and there are other um, agencies as well that want to have a role in, in kind of designing the, the world going forward here. And you got to think that Congress is going to look at this and um, think about what the right regulatory framework should be. And I think we're, this gets back to like the email thing, right? We're really at the early stages of developing this technology and there's going to have to be a whole lot of structure that's put in place to ensure that if um, this is going to be a growing technology, it kind of grows in a way that, that benefits the economy as a whole. 
So Ohio opened, uh, then recently suspended a portal it set up to accept tax payments via cryptocurrency, and Florida announced it would create a cryptocurrency seizure. Um, what are some of the most interesting cryptocurrency issue uses, pardon me, cryptocurrency uses, uses that you're seeing in state governments? We can start with Nathan on that one. So uh, this isn't a sort of by definition, it's not, a, it's not a, an open blockchain technology, but it's similar in concept. In Nevada and other states that have legalized marijuana are dealing with the issue of uh, how do they collect taxes. For the past few years, they've been uh, driving an armored truck you know, to, the, <laughs> to the business and, and collecting massive amounts of cash because that's, that's how business has to be done. Because it can't uh, be done in the banking system. Because it can't be done in the federal and the banking system. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one solution that they've come up with recently is to, they said, hey, we, we have a, a long history of doing something similar uh, in Nevada using poker chips, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you could convert this uh, US dollars into this, uh, this coin, and it can be a digital coin, and then we can then um, transfer, transfer money that way instead. So it's an interesting, it's solving a similar problem. It's getting, uh, you might say, it's taking the, the bank out of that transaction. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of interesting that a state is doing it, but uh, but there is a real, a very real problem that they're trying to solve there. So that's probably the most interesting use I've seen. Mm -hmm. Christine? Um, I mean, I actually think the tax stuff is interesting because um, the paying taxes in crypto, it, 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 it really sends a signal, I think, to consumers and businesses that this is something that they should pay attention to. Um, I, I do know there's some other um, uh, cool sort of blockchain projects that, again, aren't part of open blockchain networks um, that, that are happening at the state level in terms of trying to, to make different um, uh, uh, property registries uh, you know, more efficient and more useful and um, looking at voting and things of that nature. Um, all of that's really cool, but um, I think I think acknowledgement by state governments that cryptocurrency um, can be used as a form of payment has laid the groundwork for what we're starting to see uh, with you know the Fed thinking about this and others um, as as a as a need to modernize the way that that we transact. Mm -hmm. Any questions that sort of uh, remain post the most recent round of guidance? Are there, are there things that, uh, that you're hearing, things that, that you'd pose uh, sort of stemming from that, from that guidance? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, I think there was, a, you know, the fork issue that we were discussing earlier. Um, maybe I'll just kind of give an example to that. You know, if, if I'm a, uh, let's say my sister, um, she lives out in Colorado, you know, she owns maybe a little bit of Bitcoin and, um, you know, kind of did it for fun and it's just sitting in, in her Coinbase account and, and, you know, she doesn't look at this every day. It's just something she kind of has. There is a fork and all of a sudden she receives um, some cryptocurrency. She probably doesn't follow the news every day and isn't paying attention. You know, at, at the way the guidance is, is that that is valued at whatever it was on that first day. Um, a lot of times with these forks is the value drops fairly quickly. Um, there, there's um, different, um, you know, different ways, di lots of debate about this in, in the cryptocurrency industry. But um, all of a sudden, you know, she signs into her account a couple months later just to check the price of Bitcoin. She may have a tax liability that she never asked for mm -hmm. and like didn't even have an opportunity to, to, you know, do something with it to take advantage of it at its full value. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, figuring out if there's a way to readdress that going forward is, is something that the industry would like to see. Though, again, this is a very small issue, I think, in, in kind of the issues that are out there. Um, you know, the bigger one, as I mentioned before, is um, figuring out how to empower individuals to pay their taxes correctly mm. and accurately um, and coming up with a way to do that and doing it in a way that, um, you know, gives the industry time. I think what we have seen in FinCEN, um, you know, FinCEN came out, as I mentioned, and they were the first to come out at the federal level and, and to come up with these anti-money laundering rules. Um, uh, as a result of, of the need for law enforcement to be able to track the blockchain, we now have a, a companies like Chainalysis and Elliptic and others that have emerged in order to sort of offer that service. I think that 
if we, you know, find out the right pathway towards guidance, we will see an industry um, emerge that can support and offer those services. And, uh, but we need to figure out, um, you know, the technology is very complex. We need to figure out, uh, you know, where the IRS wants to go, where the industry can feasibly um, go, and how to kind of, as I get, you know, right now everything's sort of in silos um, in terms of the information. And the information can probably be shared, but how can that be done in a way that is most efficient and most effective um, and, um, you know, uh, not so burdensome that it brings the whole system down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Nathan? Yeah, and this, you know, there, there have been requests for a, a de minimis uh, exemption or exception for for a while now. And I don't know that the, that, uh, you know, there's, the, what people have asked for is similar to what's allowed in, in foreign currency exchanges. And so if you travel abroad and you, you, you convert your U.S. dollars into euros um, and then you spend it on your two-week vacation, then it, it's not going to fluctuate in value. Uh, that much, and so there's there's a, a threshold at which, as long as it didn't fluctuate more than that, then you don't have to report it. Doesn't have a taxable. Uh, um, there's no taxable event, mm. uh, but that's allowed under a very specific uh, code provision that's mm. specific for for foreign currency transactions. And so I don't know that the Treasury uh, or the IRS has the authority to, to do that without congressional action. But I think that's that's really. Uh, I think the next step here is we're so early on in this, and I, I think you know Mark keeps saying this too that this is this is new. It's it's a new vehicle, uh, a new financial instrument, and I think that Congress will probably step in and, and evaluate this after a good amount of time has been experienced with with IRS compliance, and um, they can then start making decisions about whether it makes sense to to create uh, a statutory exception in some situations. Um, or, you know, so the unwanted property issue, this, this, you received the cryptocurrency as a result of the fork. Well, you know, there, there may be some guidance that could be issued around um, a way to make sure that, hey, if you don't want to accept this property, it's not like a dividend where it's announced ahead of time, uh, you know it's coming. Uh, it's not always announced ahead of time, or, or rather, you're not going to be aware of it simply by um, um, holding the, the, the cryptocurrency. So. Mm -hmm. I think that you could have some guidance there around the unwanted property as well and how to, how to reject it and make sure you don't create a, a taxable event. I would add we really, as the industry, really like the idea of a de minimis um, exemption. Well. And um, it actually makes, I think, the reporting side a little bit more complex, but it would really free up um, the micropayments and use of crypto mm -hmm. on a kind of a regular and, and daily basis. Mm -hmm. and, and we think that would go a long ways towards um, advancing the industry. And the point there is that it is used as for payment sometimes, right? And, and yeah. in the future, it may be even more common than as an investment vehicle. And so I think that's, that's really the problem here is it doesn't fit neatly uh, within a bucket that currently exists, and it may deserve its own, its own definition. Yeah, I think uh, going, going forward, you're going to be faced with with a lot of uh, a lot of these situations, as people become more familiar with the roles and responsibilities and the rules going for, uh, going ahead, so I think like right now most taxpayers look at this and it just ignore cryptocurrency, and so it doesn't affect how they deal with with taxes. But if it becomes uh, more relevant to them, and I think having the IRS put out uh, more informational guides, having this be part of the form where you're kind of going through and you go, oh, I need to say yes or no, do I have crypto uh, virtual currency transactions? Mm -hmm. That's going to start to um, generate responses from, from individuals, and then there'll be a, a dialogue back and forth with either the IRS or Treasury or with their elected officials saying, well, then do something about this. And, uh, and it may be that you wind up with uh, a de minimis exceptions, or it may be that you wind up with rules for micropayments that are just different. Um, but we're at the very early stages of the, the, the process on this. And, it's kind of somewhat premature to say what the answer should be when we're still developing the, the technologies and the, and, and the rule books. Should, should we expect to see large financial institutions uh, like banks and credit card companies playing a larger role in cryptocurrency payments, you feel? I think so. Um, I think that there are a lot of efficiencies that can happen in kind of the back offices that mm -hmm. um, can, can help lower transaction costs and make uh, processes more efficient. Um, by using cryptocurrency. Um, I, I know that 
you know, when I have sort of casual conversations with folks that work at banks, they, they don't look at this as a threat necessarily um, in any way. It's actually quite the opposite. They, they want uh, regulatory certainty on all fronts so that they can improve the way that they do business um, and also um, sort of look at crypto as sort of an asset class. And so uh, I, think, I think there's um, a lot of, uh, there's maybe some initial skepticism, but I think that's sort of worn off and people are trying to figure out how to incorporate um, elements of the technology into, into their businesses. Okay. Uh, more of a question for Kristen. <laughs> The exchanges, so the, the role that the that Coinbase and other exchanges are playing, um, is there, I mean, is that a way that, that uh, large banks would get involved is, is as an exchange themselves? Um, I mean, they certainly could. They could acquire one. They could, um, they could create their own. Um, uh, I could see, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, don't want to necessarily, um, you know, have to have two separate accounts, right? Like they want to be able to log in and, you know, I log into Bank of America, I see my checking account, my savings account, my retirement account, my investment account. It's all kind of in one place. Um, I have to go to a different app to see my crypto holdings. And I think, um, you know, Fidelity and others have been working towards, you know, um, giving their customers access to this. But um, I also think banks are, um, you know, highly regulated and they, um, you know, want to do um, uh, the right thing. And then they're, um, you know, I think they want to see maybe a little bit higher level of certainty before they, they start um, incorporating that into their platforms. But I know it's, it's something that, that banks are thinking about today. Mm -hmm. And so, Chris, do you think of it as an as a opportunity, like a profit-making opportunity, or is it more like avoiding a threat that uh, their current payment systems would be disrupted? Um, maybe a little bit both, but I think it's more of a profit-making opportunity. I mean, this is something that um, particularly young consumers are very interested mm -hmm. in holding, and, um, you know, they're sort of fascinated by it. And, you know, the, the, I mean, the beauty of crypto is you don't need any institution to, to, have, right. to have that. But that's, you know, doesn't work for everybody. I mean, some people, you know... I can blow dry my own hair, but I like to go to dry bar. Like, you know, it's like sometimes you, you want to have a service and you're willing to pay for the convenience um, of doing it and not have to worry about custody issues and things of that nature. And so I, I do think there will be a, a role for banks to play. Looking into the future, right, uh, to the extent that there are like potential uses of cryptocurrencies that you'd like to see um, or that are most inter that you're most most interested in, um, what might those uses be? Um, I think one that is uh, well, a couple that come to mind um, that are actually closer to being here as opposed to being uh, kind of more theoretical. Uh, one is a project called Filecoin, mm -hmm. which um, <coughs> enables uh, essentially almost like an Airbnb for cloud storage. So uh, different providers connect up, they run open source software, and in, Instead of going to Amazon Web Services, you can you can use you can store your files with Filecoin in a way that's probably lower cost, probably more secure, and probably closer. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool because there are not a whole lot of um, that's not a particularly competitive market today. Mm -hmm. um, another one um, that that I really like is a is a project called Blockstack, which is creating um, a whole protocol that allows consumers to interact with different applications without handing over all of their personal information. So essentially they have one um, sort of secure account that when you um, go to your social networking app or your workout app or anything else, you only give the, the app that information they need in order to interact. And then when you're done and you close it, you get all their information back. And I think that's that's really cool. I mean, I know I, I started my career working on internet policy, and I was really, really, really passionate about the internet and all of the good it could do by allowing people to communicate. And then I sort of went through this phase where I hated the internet because mm -hmm. they're tracking everything I do. Like, I'm not a big fan of social media. It's, 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 uh, I, didn't, I didn't like what the internet had become. And I think when we look to the future, those people that are working on these projects today are trying to improve and fix the internet. And, and it's, uh, they call it Web 3.0. They want to build this new internet that solves all of the problems that, that sort of occurred with Web 2.0. Mm. Do you have uh, future uses, Nathan? 
Yeah, I think the, the tokenization of, of assets, even real assets, even real estate, mm -hmm. um, and just the, the opportunity to, uh, to put people who normally would not be in that market. I mean, you're really talking about opening up markets um, with tokenizing existing asset classes that, that would open it up to smaller buyers. It's similar to the idea yeah. of micropayments. Um, and so you might be able, you know, I might be able to invest my thousand dollars in a, a share of uh, Manhattan real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and and the what that does to a market that might be similar to what happened in uh, the late 80s when uh, sort of there used to be very small market cap or very, very small volume uh, in New York Stock Exchange transactions. Mm -hmm. And then as automation came into play and you were able to process many more transactions and, and, and then as brokerage firms started uh, making uh, stock transactions accessible to just anybody who had $100 and could open an account, um, you really opened up that market. And then uh, I think we've seen consistently uh, sort of PE ratios increase since then as well because you're just bringing in new markets and could increase values and just the many different things that could come from tokenization of existing asset classes. Just one, one example of, of something that as a, as a tax geek you might like to see is a payment portal at IRS where you could pay your taxes in, in cryptocurrency. And that would serve as a signal, I think, that this is actually something that is important for the, for, for the government. Before I open up the floor to the audience for questions, I just wanted to ask and perhaps start with Mark just about Final thoughts about the relationship between uh, cryptocurrencies and tax policy, tax administration broadly, um, perhaps about something that we haven't spoken about already that you feel is, is worth noting. Mark? Um, so, so I think really where, what the IRS has been doing is, is th probably the right set of strategies, is trying to raise awareness with taxpayers and ensure that um, there is some compliance going forward. And they realize that they're at the early stages of this uh, technology development, relatively early stage technology development, but want to get a bit ahead of the curve so it's not very far down uh, development path before they kind of have to come back and say, wait a minute, you know, we got these things wrong. So I think that's really, really been, been helpful. Um, I think the, the um, role of getting taxpayers comfortable with thinking about cryptocurrency as an income generating event um, is, is like a big change in mindset. And that's really something that I think people need to, to become aware of. And that's really what this inter what we're talking about today, the intersection of, of virtual currencies and, and, and tax administration. Um, but it's, it's a long, long road, I think, here. And we're just at, you know, 10 years out now or so of, of development. Um, I was surprised that, you know, as many as you know, 12 million people uh, have uh, experience with cryptocurrency. It seems like a, lot, a big take-up rate for a relatively short period of time. Yeah, so because that mindset has changed or is beginning to change and, and the IRS is really making, taking significant uh, strides here um, to raise awareness, we at h &R Block absolutely expect significantly more questions about how, how uh, taxpayers can comply with their, uh, their tax obligations when it comes to cryptocurrency. And so I think that's that's the next step and, and a year from now we're going to have a whole lot of insight that we don't currently have i think part of the the people who have been complying that's where all the questions are coming from at the moment and as you as you really broaden the sort of the the number of people who are complying and and you start getting more eyes on uh, just casual taxpayers and some of the practical problems and compliance uh, we might have a lot more interesting feedback for the IRS in a year from now. Yeah. You know, I agree. I think it's a long road before we have all of these questions answered. And um, one thing I would love to see the IRS do is uh, just kind of like FinCEN has done and like the CFTC has done, um, create a technical advisory committee that's focused on these issues. Um, I don't want to sit on that because I don't have all the technical <laughs> knowledge, but we can find, um, you know, some folks that, that are really, you know, in the weeds working with the code of these networks and, and, um, and can help, um, you know, sort of craft policy going forward. Because I, I do think, of, as we discussed, there are some outstanding questions um, when it comes to reporting. I mean, there, there's a very solid framework, and I do applaud the IRS for 
for being early, um, you know, sort of actors in the policy space. But, um, you know, I do think we have some kinks to work out, whether it be through a de minimis exemption um, or otherwise, in order for this to take off. And, you know, I think if we, if we don't, if we're in ahead of the curve here in the U.S., and I would argue we're already behind, mm. um, that, you know, people will go elsewhere. You can do this stuff from anywhere. There's an internet connection in the world, and it, you know, you don't have to be sitting in Silicon Valley to be a part of, mm -hmm. of this revolution. It's going to happen, and we want to make sure, at least I want to make sure, that the U.S. is uh, positioned to be the leader in financial services and technology for the next 100 years, just like mm. we've been for the last 100 years. Mm. So those are my questions. I, I'd love to open up the floor uh, for questions. We have persons who are walking around with microphones. Um, and I think I'll start um, just over here. We have a microphone coming your way. Hi there. Uh, my name's uh, Michael Early from The Giving Block. Um, there's been over $100 million worth of uh, charitable donations to Fidelity Charitable alone in the last year. And then uh, last week's uh, frequently asked questions really solidified those uh, tax incentives for donating to 501c3s. Um, this is mainly for Nathan and Mark, but um, what do you think personally that uh, nonprofits, donors, and most importantly, their accountants and advisors uh, should be uh, considering from a practical perspective when it comes to uh, their tax obligations and documenting those transactions? Yeah, so just uh, understanding the limits on deductions, for example, uh, and then, of course, as you say, documenting the, so, so if they're contributing over certain thresholds, then they need to um, have appraisals, qualified appraisals in that case. Um, but, but really just understanding then the value of these contributions, um, you know, you, you should, we talk about this all the time, you, you, hopefully you're, you're committed to contributing to a charity first. Um, and then you think about the tax consequences. But of course, you're, you're, you should understand the tax consequences at the time you're going to make a significant contribution. Um, and so we do have answers. Tax policy is fairly settled in that space. Um, so yeah, certainly just reach out to your tax advisor. Well, it's interesting, right? So tax policy is settled. But from the standpoint of a, a charitable organization getting a donation, um, it may be an uh, unusual situation for them. And it's not the kind of place I think where a charity typically would, would have a tax advisor to tell them how to, how to do this. And so, so it's almost like you're flipping the, the situation in a, in a different way, right? So a high-income individual who makes a donation sort of knows the rules, probably has a tax preparer to help them with it. But on the, on the other side, you know, if you're a, a local charity that all of a sudden gets you know, some units of Bitcoin as a contribution, mm -hmm. uh, this might be the first time you've ever, you've ever dealt with that experience. And so it's a unique situation for them to work through. Another question here to the back. Uh, hi, I'm Sunny Glotman with Third Way. Uh, this question's for Kristen. Um, there seems to be just, a, this is more of a policy question. Um, there's widespread bipartisan concern, um, as made evident by the debate for two nights ago, as well as um, published by academics Tim Wu, Sushana Zuboff, sort of about how the internet has evolved over the past 20 years. Um, it seems that blockchain could pose a solution, especially in terms of competition and privacy. Um, in an ideal framework, what is the blockchain association as a trade association um, seeking in terms of regulatory framework to help promote blockchain as a viable alternative to this Internet 3.0? Yeah, I mean, I think the key is to sort of freely enable um, as uh, much as possible the, the movement of cryptocurrencies. So throughout these networks because they, as I mentioned before, really are sort of the fuel of the network. Um, and going back to sort of the securities law issue, if, if a given cryptocurrency um, is bogged down because of, you know, lack of certainty on securities laws, then, um, you know, if, 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 a crypt, if, some, if a given token is deemed to be a security, you can't just go transfer it around, right? You have to go through a broker dealer. There's excessive costs in that. Um, it, it's not something that can be um, used as sort of a payment mechanism. And so making sure, just like 
Singapore, UK, um, Switzerland, and others around the world have done, making sure that these digital tokens that don't represent things that are securities, you can use tokens to represent securities, which is also like a really cool infrastructure upgrade. Um, but for these types of tokens that are supposed to move freely and be traded freely, um, to, to provide that sort of certainty and carve out so that, that they um, don't, don't fall under this rubric of securities laws, which don't make sense for open networks when there aren't, aren't information asymmetry concerns that, that a user would need to be aware of. And so I think that's probably key. Um, I do think getting the de minimis exemption is going to be a really important part of that because it does add a lot of friction to calculate all of these uh, gains with every single microtransaction. So I think that's also going to be, be a key part. Um, I, I do think there um, you know, could potentially also be a role for um, more oversight of the spot markets um, in, in a way that's not sort of a patchwork of different states looking at it from different angles, but you know, maybe having kind of a, a unified federal regulator there would, would also go a long ways towards, um, I think, easing the concerns that, that folks have around securities laws and others. So um, I, I think if there were one solution out there, I think we really like the start that the Token Taxonomy Act um, in Congress has, has proposed, because that addresses a lot of these issues. Um, I think that the um, language can probably evolve a little bit. There's probably more ideas that can be in, included in that. but that we really do need um, um, Congress to kind of come and look at this from a, a, an overarching level, which is kind of like what happened with, uh, you know, the internet in its early days. You know, the Clinton administration came out and said, hey, let's, this, this could be a big thing. Let's, let's, let's kind of have a light touch and figure out where it goes. Uh, but they also sort of proactively did things to, um, you know, prevent um, discriminatory taxes on internet access, uh, Section 230 that would limit liability on these platforms. Um, there were actually policy interventions that had to come in in the early stages in order to kind of lay the groundwork for, for a successful internet. So I, I would be, you know, I, I know Donald Trump tweeted about Bitcoin once. I hope he maybe doesn't tweet about it again. Um, but, uh, you know, it would be, it would be great, um, you know, to have, uh, you know, someone senior at Treasury or uh, the President of the United States come out and say, we want the U.S. to lead on this. We think this is going to be a big deal. Let's uh, take our time and get this right. Um, and, uh, but in lieu of that, I think having Congress look at this from a comprehensive place would, would go a long ways. Mm -hmm. Question here in the front. Um, the idea that there's this tension between whether it is right now being more, used more as an investment opportunity versus a transaction opportunity, right? So in my mind, that's sort of where the tension comes with the IRS in terms of treating it like property versus a currency. And I just keep trying to come back to other ways that we treat other things and how we move it forward. And in my mind, I sort of think of it as you could have an investment account that you could then do transactions off of it, and it's the responsibility, you know, if I do things with my Schwab account, Schwab reports that to me. And so in some ways I wonder if what we need is the agencies or the organizations to take a little more responsibility and to sort of say things like, if it is microtransactions, we say that we're doing that on a daily basis. If I pay for things on my credit card in a foreign country or I use my ATM in a foreign country, I basically, that conversion happens for me and whether we just need to build that in. Like I wonder, first, how much do you think right now, whether this is an investment versus a currency in the way it's being used of those 15 million people who have it? Are most of the people like your sister just sort of sitting on it? So it really is more like a stock versus a currency that they're using it to buy their pizza or buy their coffee. And two, is it that we basically might need there to be more responsibility or organizations taking responsibility and if there are individuals who have a thousand you know if they have like 20 different cryptocurrencies well it's going to be onerous for them to figure out those transactions but i think they're kind of doing it to themselves in some ways and it might be that they're trying to do it to avoid taxes so i think there are interesting questions but i 
I wonder at what point is it the responsibility of the groups to try and take some of the responsibility for doing some of that paperwork and moving forward? Yeah, so I can say um, a lot of the folks in, that are either US-based exchanges or have a, a large presence in the US are either um, starting to do 1099K reporting, um, though typically that is for accounts with $20,000 or more or more than 200 transactions a year. So um, again, that's not everybody, but I think it's, it's a good start. Um, other exchanges are working towards 1099K. Um, I think that there is interest and appetite amongst at least members of the Blockchain Association to go to a 1099B. They don't have all the information to do that today, and so I, that's why we have started these conversations with the IRS and with Treasury to try to, to figure that out. Um, I, I would say, though, kind of something you said at the beginning, drawing parallels. Um, uh, so people, uh, most, most people who own cryptocurrency today hold it. Okay. There, there's, that, that is the reality at the moment. That is going to shift, I think, fairly quickly as more of these projects that are um, useful to consumers come online. And so that's um, just sort of a, a, a circumstance of the fact that we're in the early days of this. That it's, you know, there's not a whole lot of like cool, fancy stuff you can do. Um, but, th but that will definitely change over time. And I think, um, you know, sort of one parallel that um, we can look at goes back to the de minimis exemption. That, that is based off a concept uh, that you do with foreign, foreign currencies. And there are some people who make it their job out of trading you know, different foreign currencies for one another and, and um, doing it that way. But there are other people that um, you know, go on vacation and on day one they um, change their dollars for euros and they're paying you know, in cash the whole time. And maybe on day 10, that foreign currency exchange rate is fluctuated, they don't have to calculate and track that. And so I, I think that that, that um, is maybe a good way that draws the line between those that are using the currency for personal use and then those that are doing these higher dollar investment style type of transactions. Yeah, and that's a tricky, a lot of high frequency trades might result in small gains and then those small gains add up over time. And so it really is a matter of how do you how do you separate the two, um, so that so that you're really only providing the exemption for uh, the person who is using it for as a form of payment. So this is, I think that's might be yeah. tricky and might require more information than currently exists. Yeah, it's not it's not easy. <laughs> Just over here. Hi, Jameson Sites RSM. So not to put anyone on the spot, but <clears throat> from a tax policy administration perspective, I don't say it first, but uh, so no yes or no, but is this recent guidance good tax policy? And what I mean is, have we increased the likelihood of compliance and have, have we actually provided certainty? I'll give two examples. It seems like we've created a lot of technical footfalls for the average individual taxpayer filing on HR block software. You know, and we, from a clarity perspective, have we increased the chance that the tax court is going to come in and say, no, you know, we have this framework of property and we have a lot of rules about realization and recognition. And let's go with the ABA uh, example of a, you know, birth of a calf. It's born, you know, some decision about basis, but you don't tax it on birth. You tax it when you sell it. So I'll leave you with that. And I think just it's a good time to have this discussion. Yeah. Right? We're in the early stages. I, not, I love, right. the guidance is great, but I think it's, this is the time for this kind of discussion. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that the production, right, the baby calf thing is difficult because uh, someone else produced this thing, created it by creating sort of a new consensus protocol that created a, new, a fork from the blockchain, and they, someone else came up with this idea. So, so someone else had the baby calf. <laughs> gave it to, to you or to, to someone else. And so that, that's a tricky sort of, so that I think that's a starting point, maybe a, a debate that can be had about um, whether it is something that was produced and should be treated as such um, that doesn't create a taxable event until it's sold at a later date. But, but I think it, it is too early. Okay, so the certainty, the, the certainty question there are absolutely going to be tax law or tax court cases, right? There, there, 
tax attorneys are going to look at this from a few angles. And one has to be uh, whether this thing has any value at the time that, that you exercise dominion and control over this, this new asset. Um, and if you didn't have any value, okay, it's a, the guidance is there. It provides certainty that, yes, it's a taxable event, but your income that you have to recognize is equal to the fair market value of the coin at the time that you, that you exercise dominion and control. And if in many of these cases, if in many of these cases you determine that there wasn't, there, there's not enough buyers and sellers on an open market uh, to establish real price discovery, and in fact, the value of this thing at the time that you received it is zero, and so you recognize zero, and now you have a basis of zero, and it doesn't really produce a taxable event until you sell it at a later date. And so I think it provided certainty in the sense that, hey, uh, this is a good starting point. But from a valuation perspective, there's a lot of uncertainty still. But also provides uncertainty and says, this is what the IRS thinks the law is. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, before, you may not have known what the IRS's position is. Now you do. And so if you don't like that position, you can take a different one um, and maybe litigate it and, and end up prevailing on, on that. But um, prior to this, I think it was just wide open what, what the rules were there. And so at least now you've gotten something mm -hmm. in, this, in this most recent guidance, which is a, is a step forward. And I think really you should, we should think of this as a fairly long process of um, moving, al moving along to develop rules and regulations and, and processes that will address virtual currency transactions. And not every step, it's not like a linear path, and not every step is going to be, gonna be a, a, a positive one. But it's part of the whole, the whole journey of getting this, this uh, system in place. I think we have time for two more questions. Just here. Hi, I'm Paul Brigner from the Chamber of Digital Commerce. I think it's safe to say one of the biggest developments in the cryptocurrency space over the past year or so has been the development of stable coins. So we haven't heard that today or your opinions about that. I'm just curious what you think about those. I think there's a perception by many people that that just resolves this whole issue, but maybe that's not the case. Um, no, I think, I think stable coins um, can go a long ways towards uh, sort of, if, if you're looking at uh, paying for goods and services, um, maybe not digital services, but you know, if you want to buy your cup of coffee with a stable coin, that, that should be um, you know, a much easier way to do it. I, I think, so stable coins are, are, there's different types of stable coins. There are some that are algorithmic, there are some that are backed by, uh, well, well, Facebook's trying to do a stable coin that's backed by a basket of currencies. Um, there's a couple here, um, like USDC, which is a joint project of Coinbase and Circle, uh, or True USD, which is um, uh, Trust Tokens, uh, stable coin, uh, where where the the token is backed by a dollar one to one. And I think these are um, uh, wonderful innovations. I, you know, would like to see. There's there's been a little bit of discussion on the Hill lately. Um, about you know getting the Fed more active um, in this space and maybe doing sort of a, a fiat-backed currency. I actually think there is a thriving stablecoin market today. There's a lot of technology and innovation, and and um, I I don't, I don't think we necessarily even need the Fed to do that because we have a marketplace that is addressing the the technology side of it. So um, I think that that could definitely go a long ways um, towards. Um, addressing some of these, but it doesn't address the tokens that are specific to like some type of digital service. Um, but yes, I think I think that's a key piece. Yeah, it certainly would resemble currency more so in that situation. And so the, the fluctuation in value um, when compared to U.S. dollars, of course, if it was tied to U.S. dollars, like yeah. like the USDC, um, certainly in that case, you have a better argument that a, a de minimis, de minimis Exemption should absolutely apply because uh, well, it's no longer an investment. Yeah, it's no yeah. longer an investment. Mm -hmm. Time for one more question. Just over here. Thank you, uh, Christian Cole, IMF. Uh, my background is more uh, European than US uh, based. Uh, my question is looking at the situation in the US, you see there are some options if you look from the enforcement point of view to get information to the IRS about uh, transactions ownership and so on 
Um, this is more complicated if you look in an international uh, context. Um, FATCA was already uh, mentioned. And as you say, these platforms are more and more international. Good, the good thing is that many are based in, in the US, but if you would reason from a, let's say, European perspective or even developing country perspective, um, what would be the best advice that you, that you could give uh, governments? It's a very open question, I realize that. Um, but the related question is, do you think that this is a space that calls for more, let's say, international standards and cooperation? Thanks. Um, I know there's a lot of work going on um, to coordinate um, uh, governments and, and companies internationally. I think uh, the, the Financial Action Task Force um, has done a lot of work in, in coordinating governments and, and coming out with <laughs> guidance uh, for anti-money laundering um, uh, regulations. And, and just, um, that was passed earlier this summer, and now countries are figuring out uh, how to implement them at home. So I think there's been some good coordination there. Um, there's uh, an, organization, an organization called Global Digital Finance that um, works to coordinate um, uh, just standard setting discussions across international bodies and they put out codes of conduct um, and recommendations for, for, different, for different countries. So I think the, the industry um, you know, the nature of this technology is that it can be anywhere the internet is, and that's quite a bit of the world these days. And so um, having um, laws that are, um, you know, uh, similar in different jurisdictions, I think really facilitates um, the movement um, of this. So, um, yeah, I think the, the, the work that's being done in that space is very, very important, and, um, and that there is an appetite um, for some consistency among among regulators. Yeah, and if you think about uh, the anti-money laundering rules and, and what it takes to establish an account, um, the know your customer rules, um, creating a standard there could really go a long ways for enforcement. Um, I know, so, so if you create an account uh, in the US um, you, you have to provide quite a bit of personal information. Um, I know in the UK and, and under EU rules, uh, you're, you're taking a picture of your photo ID um, front and back and, and a picture of yourself. And um, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, effort going in to establish identity, uh, really digital identity rules um, for all sorts of purposes. And I, so I, I think the it's tricky because digital identity isn't very well established, right? So, so it's, everyone's trying to solve this um, and creating some standard. It doesn't really have to be a, a, a really high barrier probably at this point, but, but having a standard there um, goes a long ways towards enforcement. Kristen, Nathan, Mark, thank you for today's conversation. And to the audience, thank you for your questions and for tuning in. Uh, for those who are watching via the stream. Um, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you.